<laughs> Am I right? Is Ambassador uh, Patrick Duddy? Uh, uh, Ambassador Duddy has, uh, is our, the last American ambassador to serve in Venezuela. He's been expelled twice <laughs> by, by the president of Venezuela. And, uh, and he, before that, he was the deputy assistant secretary for uh, the Americas, uh, for the Western Hemisphere. And before that, he was Consul General in Sao Paulo, and he's been the chief, a Deputy Chief of Mission in La Paz, Bolivia. He served in the Dominican Republic, in Chile, in Panama, and various other places in Latin America. So he's a, an old Latin American hand, but he is uh, our, uh, our if, if the, the last American ambassador in Venezuela. He knows a lot about Venezuela, and um, we're, we're very glad that he is a, uh, a senior uh, visiting lecturer here at do. Uh, then uh, next to Patrick is Ryan Nelson, who is a journalist who has a journalist and teacher who has spent many years in Latin America. And in fact, uh, he went there, uh, one of his first experiences was in Maracaibo, if I recall correctly. That's right. And uh, he has written a uh, really wonderful book about Venezuela called The Silence of the Scorpion, The Coup Against Chavez, The Making of Modern Venezuela, which is a uh, which I read with extraordinary interest. I think it's a very balanced and uh, very interesting book about uh, the situation. The situation, of course, has changed since that book was written, but there's nothing that 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 has, that has I think, disconfirmed any of the observations in that book. Uh, Brian is currently teaching at the John Hopkins University Center for Talented Youth. And before that, he taught at Miami University, and uh, he's. Uh, author of quite a few uh, articles. He's a well-known uh, uh, writer and, and, and as well as a journalist. And our third member of the panel will speak first is Miguel Chirinos, who is a Venezuelan, another Venezuelan, who is uh, uh, going to have to leave after, shortly after his remarks because he's going giving a speech about Simón Bolívar <laughs> at, at somewhere else in Durham. <laughs> Sorry about that. And Miguel is from the uh, historic city of uh, La Victoria, in the state of uh, Tachira. I'm mean, no, sorry, the state of Aragua, uh, 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 <laughs> which is also well known because uh, the state of Aragua is where um, um, uh, Gomez, uh, President Gomez, had his summer uh, capital in Maracay. Uh, Miguel is a an historian. He writes, uh, he's been writing articles and books about Venezuela, and also he's currently engaged in studies of the Venezuelan presence in the United States, historically, uh, looking at all the cities and towns called either uh, Bolivar or uh, Bolivia in the United <laughs> States. And there are statues of Bolivar all across the country. And he's looking into that. Uh, he is also a computer specialist. And he has lived here in Durham for quite a few years. He's been in the United States for some uh, 19 years total, is that right? I think so. And, uh, while he is, uh, uh, makes a living in, uh, as a computer specialist for the Durham schools, he is, in fact, another historian, uh, or an Iranian historian, I guess. We have a diplomat, a writer, and a historian right. um, uh, here at the table. So I will stop with that and sit down and uh, invite Miguel to uh, begin our program. Sure. Thank you so much. So um, thank you for the introduction and welcome, everybody. Um, um, as I said, well, I was born in Caracas, uh, but I grew up in, uh, in Aragua State. And I um, uh, would like also to add to the introduction that I'm, uh, also I'm a, a new Hispanic. I've been studying about cons and paper money uh, for over 35 years. And in 2000, I uh, did a project for the Latino Credit Union, also known here as the Cooperativa Latina. So I prepared this uh, 20 uh, posters with uh, some uh, explaining the origin of some currency units in Latin America. Among them, uh, Venezuela that uh, adopted the El Bolivar in uh, 1879 uh, under the presidential of, um, under the president of uh, General Guzman Blanco. So I want to start with my presentation talking about a, a brief overview of what's going on in Venezuela over the last 30 years. So the first uh, date that I'm going to start is on uh, February 18, <coughs> 1993. Some historians call this date as a uh, Viernes Negro or um, Black Friday. Different connotation here in the United States. <laughs> so uh, it wasn't a, a really sad uh, 
date for us because uh, Bolivar was a, one of the most stable uh, currency in the region, uh, started a uh, devaluation process. So um, this occurred during the presidency of uh, Luis Aguera Campins, who was uh, uh, belongs to uh, Coque, is uh, one of the parties in, in Venezuela, one of the biggest parties in Venezuela, um, Acción Democrática or Democratic Action, and Coque that is a social Christian party. So, um, <clears throat> unfortunately, the government, led by President Herrera, uh, established an exchange controls and uh, uh, unfortunately, the evaluation process started at that time. Uh, we, in the 70s, uh, we have uh, the cold uh, oil, uh, boom oil, and uh, we had a very uh, stable um, currency unit the exchange rate was four bolivars and 30 cents per US dollar. And it was for about 23 or 25 years. But unfortunately, in 1983, the devaluation uh, started with a, uh, uh, affecting our economy and uh, with some uh, economical consequences like inflation, of course. So um, the next uh, episode was uh, six years later, February 27, 19. Uh, some people call it the Caracasso. Um, this is uh, similar to another situation from here in, in Colombia, when a uh, um, very important leader, a very important political leader named uh, uh, Jorge Díaz Gartán was killed in Bogotá. So <coughs> after that, um, occurred some looting, uh, riots, uh, shootings, etc. So, and the historian named that episode in Colombia as El Bogotazo. So, um, the same situation occurred in 1999 in Venezuela. So, uh, and during a transition of two governments of Jaime Lucinchi and Carlos Andres Pérez, um, people uh, started with a wave of protests, uh, riots, looting, shootings, and of course, occurred some massacres over there. Uh, official figures, uh, said that around 280 people died in that episode. But other sources revealed that um, probably reached between 35 to 40,000 people died in that episode. So um, most of them was buried in a mass grave in a place in a very important center in Caracas called La Peste. So um, it's a cemetery in Venezuela. Um, then uh, we have to move to the following uh, episode, another sad episode. So it was in uh, February 4, 1992. So um, a group of military leading by people like Arias Cárdenas, uh, who was as a Chavez, or Acosta Chirinos, um, were trying to do a coup d'etat to President um, Carlos Andrés Pérez. So um, <coughs> all, most of the people who were involved in this movement on this group of military people um, take all the military fortresses and Chavez was um, had a, was appointed to take the presidential house and then and, and Miraflores here like White House too. So unfortunately Chavez failed in that mission so um, all were arrested and put in jail. Chavez was in jail for two or three years. So um, most of the people died in, those, in, those, in that episode. So, and in 1994, occurred uh, uh, the historian called Banking and Financial Crisis. So, around uh, 17 banks declared bankruptcy <coughs> in Venezuela, probably as a consequence of that situation in 1992. So, then, uh, well, in 1998, uh, Chavez uh, won the elections and then reformed the constitution in 2000, but in 2002, if you were another situation, another political situation, when um, Chavez was removed from his uh, position as a president for between 48 to 72 hours. So, and um, uh, one of the uh, leaders of the position at that time, Mr. Carmona, was mm -hmm. president of Federal Cameras and became an interim president of the Republic of Venezuela. But, uh, Suddenly, Chavez returned to the power on uh, April 14th. Um, <clears throat> finally, on the 
February 12, 2014, uh, I started with some uh, students and uh, civilians with some protests and demonstrations in Caracas, and also in other main cities in Venezuela. And it's curious because that day, uh, President Maduro was in La Victoria, uh, because they have a special event commemorating the bicentennial of the Battle of La Victoria. So, as I uh, mentioned during the introduction, uh, I grew up in La Victoria, so when I was in the school, and elementary and secondary school, I was a part of some military parades, and, uh, so we have the opportunity to visit some museums, and when in the Plaza Rivas, they recreate sometimes the, the Battle of La Victoria. It's because uh, the um, Patriots defeat the Royalists at that time, and we were talking about the February 12, 1814. So, um, they call also La Batalla de, de la Juventud, because some seminaries uh, joined to the Patriots and defeat the, the Royalists, leading by Boris in that time. So, in 2014, Maduro was in the Victoria, uh, opening, uh, doing a, doing a opening day for a, a monument in tribute to the Battle of La Victoria. So all the TV station was covering that event when the students went in other parts of Venezuela doing demonstration protests and talk to that. So it's a very emblematic uh, day for, for the students in Venezuela. So and now well, we know that the consequences right now there are over almost 40 people died already. And uh, one of the main leaders of the opposition, uh, Lopez, is in jail. So um, there is a uh, brutal repression right now between <coughs> students and other civilians in the streets. So the situation <coughs> doesn't look good. The panorama no not looking muy bien, so um, uh, we, we see what's going on and down there in Venezuela. Well. Thank you so much. Great. <laughs> Great. Great. Okay. Um, thank you very much for inviting me. It's great to be back here. Um, I went to Venezuela in 1988 as a, a high school exchange student, so I did my senior year in Maracaibo. And um, it was, of course, a very important, pivotal kind of year for me. I made very close uh, connection with my host family and with a lot of the students that I went to school with. And I was also very lucky because um, throughout the, uh, the 90s, I was able to go back just about every year. So I was going back for a month or two months or as much as I could. And uh, as Miguel was saying, the 90s was this very difficult kind of slow descent, uh, increasing crime, increasing violence, the bank failures that you mentioned. And so I remember going back and, and um, each year people would go, oh, you know, things are really bad, but, but next year, you know, they're going to get better because they just can't get any worse. And then the next year would come along and they'd be like, it would be worse. So when Chavez came along in 1998, right, and um, was promising this revolution, promising to sort of start over again. You know, my um, initial reaction was, was great. This is what we need. We need to really start over. We have to deal with all the corruption, all the problems that Venezuela has. So I was a pretty strong Chavista uh, at the beginning. And then in 2002, I uh, was able to go back to Venezuela and I started to work on a book about the coup that had happened earlier that year. So I got there in <coughs> September and the coup adapt happened in April. And I was actually, honestly, really expecting to find a very kind of classic coup scenario, like we had in, in Chile in 1973, in Guatemala in 1954. I expected to find, um, you know, these rich business leaders had sort of come and taken over, that um, this is the military that um, you know, was responsible for most of the violence that occurred that day. Uh, I was actually expecting to find U.S. involvement uh, in, in the coup. And I, and, and I did. I actually found something very different. And while there were illegal things done by the opposition, what I discovered through my research was that the coup had been, the violence that, that sort of sparked the coup had been initiated by the Chavez government, and that it was premeditated. And um, also that the revolt within the military had been caused largely by Chavez making an illegal order, asking the military to oppress the march that was approaching the palace. So that was a big kind of turning point for me in my sort of, in my political thinking and my own kind of personal ideology. And it was an important moment in Venezuelan history too because that was the first time we had 
uh, political violence from the Chavez government. And of course, we're seeing a lot more of that today. So this was sort of the first instance of that. And what it also signaled for me was that the Chavez government was, had sort of decided, or the, the Venezuelan government had decided that there was a sort of greater good out there, this sort of transcendental idea of the, of the revolution that uh, was more important than the law. And so when it came to a decision about should, should we oppress a, a, a manifestation or should we follow the law, the, the choice over and over again was that we had to save the revolution. Okay? And obviously you can begin to see how dangerous this sort of thinking is. And um, so that's hopefully something we'll get to talk about a little bit more about exactly kind of what's happening with these manifestations. But, um, the, the talk today is sort of about what we view as the future of Venezuela. And it's my strong belief, actually, that the revolution is, is going to continue. Um, not because I particularly want it to, but because most of the democratic institutions have already been eroded. That the ability for any kind of um, uh, movement away from the Maduro government has, has basically been closed. And also, because of the things we're seeing now with the censorship, um, the repression of the march, um, the, the arrest of political activists on the opposition. I don't believe that this is a government that is going to allow an electoral defeat. So that's basically my position at this point. Great. I, I don't know if all of these are on. Um, as um, my colleagues on the panel. Uh, have begun with um, a little bit of uh, biographical information. Um, I wasn't born in uh, La Victoria, and I didn't go to uh, Maracaibo for my senior year of high school. Uh, um, uh, although um, I, I remember many of the events of that year as I was, um, I think, in Central America during the period of the negotiations at the time. I went to uh, Venezuela in 2007 as the ambassador for the Bush administration. For those of you who have um, read Condoleezza Rice's book on uh, her time as uh, Secretary of State, you may have noted in a, in a section um, really focused on the Marco Plata summit in uh, 2005. Um, but she notes at a certain point that in 2005, 2006, um, there was a decided um, uh, preference inside the State Department to kind of lower the, what we would say was the decibel level of um, um, our ongoing um, uh, rather nasty relationship um, with Venezuela. And I was the next ambassador out after that. Um, and um, in no small measure, because we had decided that it was um, probably the wiser course for the United States, we. Um, we, we tried to lead um, uh, on the ground in Caracas and elsewhere in the country um, with the message that the U.S. was interested in a more productive relationship, a more functional relationship with Venezuela. And for those of you who um, uh, uh, sort of look these things up on the internet, you, you will see that I was um, somewhat uh, tediously uh, um, repetitious in, in trying to get that message out there. Um, uh, far and wide around the country. Um, I, I note that uh, partially uh, because um, I also had a, a, a seminal experience early in my tenure in Venezuela, um, which persuaded me, and, uh, and I think correctly, uh, to understand that the, the government in Venezuela was not interested in a better relationship with the United States. Protestations to the contrary notwithstanding, especially when those protestations were made outside of the country, um, in the, in the in the fall of 2007, and I'll, I'll, I'll segue very quickly from this anecdote to the current circumstances. But in the fall of 2007, um, the, um, President Chavez, having just a few months earlier in late uh, 2006 won a resounding uh, victory uh, um, uh, and, and been reelected with something like 60 odd percent of the vote, introduced more than 40 constitutional, uh, a, a, you know, a referendum to change more than 40 articles of the Constitution. Uh, uh, 
he, uh, he was apparently supremely confident that those uh, changes would be um, uh, accepted, uh, embraced, and went off on a trip to Europe um, uh, and to the Middle East, only to return and find that, much to his uh, astonishment, uh, in fact, his proposed changes, which included um, getting rid of term limits um, and thus permitting him to run for re-election again, um, that his uh, proposed re um, changes were in fact losing, and losing relatively badly um, uh, around the country. Virtually all of the polls showed the same thing, that, they, that in, in a very short campaign, something on the order of 10% uh, of, of the you know, there was a 10% advantage for the no vote. Now, a couple of things happened there that I thought were very interesting. First of all, um, President Chavez returned to the country, and there were lots of other things going on. We could talk about some of those other things. But he returned to the country and threw himself into the yes campaign, the C campaign. And in an astonishingly short period, he nearly reversed a very decided trend. That was an important lesson for me. Right? I, I had watched the issue being discussed and seeing that it was in deep trouble, but largely by force of his personality, in a matter of days, Chavez very, very nearly um, reversed a, a very decided trend at the very last minute. I thought that was pretty remarkable. Now, um, he concluded his participation in that campaign I think it was the Friday before the vote. It was a huge rally in um, uh, in Caracas, and at you know sort of the, the the a key moment, the pivotal moment, the crescendo of what was you know a, a, as he was wont to do a very long speech right, um, that covered um, um, a, a fairly wide range of, of, of issues. He said, and he warned the public, "This is all you know. This is all out there on film." A vote no is a vote for George Bush. And a vote yes is a vote for me. So what had not initially been characterized um, as a referendum only on the president, he essentially, partially by, by virtue of his energy and partially by virtue of, of his language at a key moment, made his followers understand that it was in fact a going to be a referendum on him, on his government, on his person. And on, and on the revolution, and they voted no. A vote yes uh, was a vote for Hugo Chavez, and a vote no was a vote for, for um, uh, George Bush. It was an astonishing development, and, Ch and I watched Chavez's um, es effectively concession at about 1.30 in the morning, and he was a very um, unhappy man. Um, but um, not necessarily um, humbled, by this debate, and, 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 and in fact, um, what we saw in the months and years to come, that he redoubled his effort to consolidate the revolution. I think in, it was interesting, principally, because two things, um, I learned two things from it. One, that um, at least in the Venezuelan political context, President Chavez was a force of nature. Um, he, in, outside the country, he, had, he, was, he was frequently lampooned. Um, as, as a sort of a cartoon figure, almost out of a different era um, um, in Latin America. But he wasn't that. He wasn't that. And I think that's important to remember. He, he was an autodidact. He was not an edu a conventionally educated person. But he had a very sophisticated understanding of, of the electorate. And he managed to connect with the electorate in ways which, to this day, not everyone is entirely willing to credit. I don't know if your own sense is the same as mine. Um, the other thing, that, of course, that I learned was um, that fundamental to his, his political dialogue, to his, his dialectic, to his, his uh, conversation with the nation, um, was a, a very um, uh, uh, hard-edged kind of anti-Americanism. And so, to some degree, I, you know, I, um, I was startled by that. Um, I also tried to redouble our efforts. And, um, uh, and about eight or nine months later, I actually managed to have a, a very productive and quasi-public conversation with uh, President Chavez about um, renewing uh, contact with and conversations on a range of bilateral issues, um, only um, to be um, 
to see that sort of rotted ground in, in, in a few weeks later, and, and then rather to my uh, surprise, um, to a degree, to be expelled um, in, uh, on September 11th um, of uh, 2008. Um, I, I went back in a year. Um, in fact, do you have any of those? Um, I'm, I'm not sure if we have any of the pictures up there um, with me of, uh, no, uh, go a little bit further. Um, no, there's, I'm afraid I don't have the picture of, of uh, President Chavez with, um, with President Obama, but after a, a brief conversation in Trinidad and Tobago, President, uh, President Obama and, Pre and, and President uh, Chavez decided that they would try one more time. There's a reason for that, we can go into it later. Um, but curiously enough, um, and for apparently the first time in our diplomatic history, an ambassador who had been um, declared persona non grata and expelled from the country actually returned to the country in the same capacity, accredited to the same government, although this time sent by a different president. Uh, um, uh, notwithstanding that effort, things have not gotten better in recent years. And, and that, that, I suppose, is the big thing. Well, we haven't had an ambassador since I left. And, you know, as recently as a few days ago, we heard yet again from um, uh, President Maduro that um, the, uh, uh, the demonstrations against his government were either uh, funded by, inspired by, or possibly being directed by um, uh, sort of shadowy forces in the United States, if not by the U.S. government itself. Um, uh, very quickly, um, I would say, number one, that's nonsense. What we do know, what, what, what we do know, and what um, uh, is often and has often been confirmed by um, the administration in terms of the proximate reasons for the current uh, wave of uh, 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 demonstrations against the government is that um, the, uh, the revolution has um, basically failed on almost every economic front. Um, and um, its failures are, are beginning to be felt at a, at a level, with a level of granularity in the lives of uh, Venezuelans in many parts of the country that they have flowed into the streets. Now, what, what am I talking about? Well, last year inflation was approximately 56%. That's pretty darn alarming. It's even more alarming if you understand that the previous five years saw inflation at more than 20% a year, um, one year popping up to 32%. Imagine, if you will, what that does. Um, to, um, to, to any cash instrument you may have around that is actually denominated in Bolivar, right? Um, the scarcity index, according to the Venezuelan Central Bank, not, not the Economist um, or the Wall Street Journal, but according to the Venezuelan Central Bank, the, the, the scarcity index at the moment is at about 28%. That means that on any given day in any given supermarket, if you are looking for things that are listed as a part of um, uh, sort of the standard, what they call the cesta basica, panasta basica, list of the usual consumables, more than one out of every four items can't be found on the shelves. And if you read the Venezuelan papers or visit the, their, their websites online, three days a week you'll see pictures of uh, supermarkets with empty shelves. What else? Dollars have become, you know, there's, the, the, there's a, an exchange rate regime that has frequently seemed cartoonish. The official rate is 6.3. The parallel rate has until recently been over 80. Right? Um, there, are several other, there are several mechanisms for, for getting dollars at something other than um, the official rate. Um, but access to those mechanisms has been limited. Recently, they created yet a new mechanism, which appears to have lowered the effective exchange rate to something like 58 um, to the dollar. This is astonishing, right? Um, a country that was a net exporter of food is now massively an importer of food, um, uh, as well as of almost everything except oil. The oil industry itself has stagnated since a, a general strike early in the, um, uh, the, the new millennium. Um, and uh, criminal violence has uh, spiked to levels that are almost inconceivable uh, for most people. Um, uh, it was recently estimated um, that um, there are about 79 murders 
per year for every 100,000 residents. Caracas was um, listed as the third most violent city in the world and the single most violent capital city in the world. You can dispute the numbers, you know, and, and maybe push either the country or, or, or Caracas down a couple of levels if you challenge those NGOs. But we are nevertheless talking about um, a country with, that is immensely rich in terms of natural resources, in which there was an extraordinarily um, uh, international cosmopolitan private sector that has the world's largest reserves of conventional um, uh, and, and you know, sort of quasi-conventional oils, meaning some extra heavy oils. And they can't keep the shelf stocked or maintain you know, a, a relatively um, uh, safe urban environment. It is in this context that they have been challenged in the street repeatedly in recent years. And, um, uh, I would certainly agree my own perception um, is that Brian is quite correct that in, in instance after instance, and particularly in the, in the recent wave of demonstrations, um, the government has opted for um, uh, bully boy tactics as, a, as opposed to dialogue um, with the opposition as a way of dealing with this unrest. And accompanying those tactics has been accusations that external actors are responsible for you know, the violence and for the unhappiness on the ground. <coughs> even now, many, many non-US and um, um, other, even Latin NGOs are, have, have recently come out and said, you know, they've, they've visited, they've looked things over. There's just no evidence of any external actors. There is extraordinary evidence of dysfunction within the economy. Now, I'm making this distinction for, for one further reason, and, and I think it is, it is relevant to what's going on still. And that is that notwithstanding the economic difficulties, and, and, and they are difficulties which, which affect all sectors, um, notwithstanding those difficulties, the government of President Maduro and the revolution per se continue to enjoy very considerable support. A part of the dilemma that we're looking at here is, is that there, while at the moment most Venezuelans think things are going badly, there is still a very strong core of Venezuelans who identify with the revolution. Nicolas Maduro, whom, with whom I, I spoke I'm not sure if many would be the term, but um, for a, 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 you know, a host country ambassador from a country that they considered to be the empire and frequently categorized as the, em as the empire, I met with him a lot during my tenure there. And I actually knew him before I got there, and we had met before I was ambassador and before he was foreign minister. So I met him years before in Brazil. Um, so I, I had talked with him a good bit. Um, Unfortunately, in the current circumstances, right, um, what we see is that he, he, he's not Hugo Chavez, but he did win, whether you believe he actually won the last election or not, it was pretty darn near a 50-50 split. And while there has been some erosion in his base, he still has a base. With 56% inflation, one of the highest murder rates in the capital city in the world, right, with a 25% scarcity index in the grocery stores, there are still a lot of people in Venezuela who characterize themselves as chavistas. And as long as that is the case, the government isn't going anywhere, and um, the opposition um, isn't going to get any happier, I think, in the near term. The government has made it quite clear that they are in in, um, embarked on a process of completely transforming the, the country into a socialist republic and with a socialist economy. In the plan Simon Bilou, uh, Bolivar, 2008 uh, uh, something like that, their, their last published um, economic um, uh, program, they, they characterized the private sector as a transitory necessity. So one of the things that it appears to be true um, is that they are embarked on a revolutionary agenda. 
And those people, much of whom are in, many of whom are in the opposition, who characterize themselves as free marketeers, private sector oriented, if they feel as though the government is largely uninterested in, uh, in their sectors, it's correct. Um, it's correct. Um, um, and as I say, and I'll finish with this, but it is a deeply divided country. Um, and one in which um, the, the, the opposition appears determined to challenge the government, and where the government appears determined to hang on, even at the cost of having to um, um, uh, depart from um, some of its um, some of the principles that all of the hemisphere embraced when they signed the Inter-American Democratic Charter. Okay, let's stop there and open it up for, for questions and observations. Uh, I have a couple myself, but I'm going to hold them off until we hear from some of the people who are present. Yes. Uh, okay, so I have a couple of questions. Um, one is about in the first is sort of in response to Brian, your statement that you don't think that the country, that the government will allow an electoral defeat. And this is kind of then sort of loops back around to your, your final point, Ambassador Deddy, about the fact that there is significant, a significant base that still exists inside the country. Like I know, for me, most of the friends that I have, so the last time I was in Venezuela was in 2012, um, which was during the election. Um, and I haven't been back since Chavez passed. Um, but that I remember all of the news um, pushed out of the country that the country was on the brink of civil war and that it was so dangerous. And I just remember like the everyday sort of mundaneness of life when everybody sort of in the rest of the world was thinking that the country was about to fall apart. Um, and then that, that so many people then do support that because so yes, largely we know that the economy needs to diversify. You can't survive sort of just on oil revenue. However, people who live in Barlovento, two hours from Caracas, uh, like literally attribute the fact that they have sound transportation between Barlovento and Caracas to the to the Chavi, to the Chavis, to the Chavez government, and all of these infrastructural changes, which are like for a for a lot of Venezuelans, for the vast majority of Venezuelans who don't sort of participate in these sort of black market exchange rates of US dollars, have seen real change in their everyday lives, have seen access to infrastructure and water and lights and food and education. And I mean, so I mean, I just, I don't know. So, so what's the question? It's, oh, so I'm really thinking about the narrative that's being shaped yeah. here mm -hmm. with, with the way that, um, so it, are we at the end of revolution is the question for the panel. And the, the consensus is that no, but because it's sort of like fascist. And I'm, like, I'm, ch I'm trying to figure out, like, mm -hmm. I don't know, like, what's the investment in that narrative? Let, let me just say, talking mm -hmm. about 2012 and that campaign first, mm -hmm. um, a part of the reason why mm -hmm. um, certainly I, but lots of others too, have concluded that the, um, uh, the Bolivarian, um, the, the PSUB, and that the Bolivarian mm -hmm. Party, um, uh, would not surrender uh, power even if defeated is partially because people in the group said so, and they said it publicly. Mm -hmm. uh, um, Alain Chavez said publicly, we need to be prefer pre prepared at a time when the polls were showing after Chavez's illness was initially announced mm -hmm. um, that he might not survive. And, and understanding that his revolution had never conducted a national campaign without Chavez mm -hmm. at the top of the ticket. Um, that, that what his brother was saying is, um, he said literally, you need to be prepared to defend the revolution, quote, by force of arms. President Chavez said repeatedly and in public that if I am not reelected, there's going to be trouble. My people are going to come out into the street. I have the quotes. He said it repeatedly. So one of the things that was um, widely discussed, I know because I was back here by then, at the time um, was the degree to which some of that um, could be dismissed as rhetoric and um, to what degree it in fact um, uh, was a warning to the larger public. What we have seen um, in um, the current demonstrations, particularly with the groups known as colectivos mm -hmm. um, or motorizados, mm -hmm. um, has been um, the presence of um, violent elements, not official government elements, but violent elements from the Chavista base attacking demonstrators. 
And in one case, it was all, uh, literally, it was caught on, on, on film by, um, by a CNN crew. <coughs> uh, um, uh, and, it, and it has been fairly generalized. So there, there is, I think, a sense when you've got, say, after the March, uh, was it, uh, no, the April elections, when, when there are um, over 3,500 um, complaints of irregularities at the polls, and they are sort of, the entire list of them is, is dismissed out of hand, while at the same time, uh, um, the, the, the final result is announced before the voting overseas um, is, uh, is in fact counted. It, it suggests that they're in a hurry to declare victory at the early po earliest possible moment, and that, I think, for, my, for many in the international community, undermined the sense that, that the government was, in fact, really open um, to any outcome other than the one that, that favored them. So, Ryan or McGill, do you want to? Um, uh, I would say that you're, you're actually right. There's, there's multiple narratives going on here. Okay? There's, there's a lot of people who have benefited a great deal get food a lot cheaper than they got food before. Uh, there are people who are, are part of these programs who get, um, you know, I, I actually was able to do some interviews in, in the palace, and we were, we were in, in this huge, big room in the palace, in Minnesota, and there were just all these people camped out. And I said, you know, what's the deal? And I started talking to them. And they said, yeah, we were from, you know, the, near the Amazon, you know, and Amazon, that's when they, they're, they're, they want to move flooded. And they just came to Caracas. And when Chavez heard of that, he said, okay, you, you stay here and you eat here and we, we're taking care of you. Okay? So those people, you know, of course, are going on. So there, there's definitely multiple narratives going on. So, um, you know, there's a lot, it, it becomes very really complicated, you know, there's been so much oil influx, you know. Um, how much is attributed to what the government has done versus how much is done to just the fact that they've, they've been in such a great oil boom and it's been so helpful that it's kind of risen up risen all boats. Um, but yeah, there, there's, there's definitely, uh, we're not going to have a civil war in Venezuela. It's not going to erupt in complete anarchy and violence. Um, but um, that's because I believe it's just going to, that core is going to continue to, to, to exist, the, the hardcore Chavista. Um, the opposition is just going to be pushed down and down and down, very settled. Um, and what you're seeing now is very different. You know, some people are trying to make you know, similarities to April 11th and talking about how there's going to be another coup. And there isn't going to be another coup because all of the military leaders who might have uh, launched such a thing are gone. Um, during 2002, of course, you had generals coming out almost daily, you know, going down to Altamira and and um, you know, showing that they were against the Chavez government. That isn't happening at all now. So within the military, the military isn't going to be sparking any type of coup. So that's taken care of. And within civil society, of course, um, the rock throws and the Molotov cocktail guys are not going to have much chance of any long-term progress against the, against the government. So I'd like to just make an observation on the same thing. I think there's no doubt in anybody's mind that Chavez has brought a higher standard of living to a lot of people at the bottom. There's, there's much much less inequality in Venezuela now, and all the uh, data show there's less poverty than the rest of the people uh, However, that is not the result of growth, that's a result of redistribution, and redistribution funded basically by oil money. And so essentially the government has been subsidizing all of the social gains that, that people experience, which are significant gains. The, uh, for me, the question is whether this model is sustainable. And uh, I think the evidence is building up that it's not a sustainable model because oil exports are dropping, uh, the government is highly indebted internationally, uh, the rate of inflation is extremely high, the local sectors of production, which were, like Venezuela was ahead of many viable sectors, are, all those sectors are, have declining uh, uh, product. And so this is this has in a sense not been a a, re a revolution in the sense of a social revolution or, or it's been more of a deinstitutionalization in which government largesse is replacing the private sector in different ways. And the question is, is that sustainable? My own belief is it is not. 
So the question is, what happens to Venezuela when the government can no longer provide, when they have to raise the price of gasoline, when they, when they can no longer afford to buy food and import food from outside? Uh, they have been postponing investments in the oil sector, which were long overdue, because they're using that revenue to subsidize the social program. So, uh, and that's the dilemma, that's what Maduro has inherited. And the question is, how long can the government hold out and continue this particular model? And I'm fairly pessimistic that that can go on. But that's, that's my view. If I just a footnote to that, one of the things that is certainly true, one of the things that is certainly true is that if there's a spike in global oil prices, uh, um, uh, then, then the uh, Maduro administration will get a new lease on life. Right? That's, that's absolutely clear. And correspondingly, if there is a sharp decline, um, that the, the pinch being felt by the, um, uh, the average citizen will become much sharper. Um, uh, as, as Brian suggests, and I observed as well, and, and it, part of the reason why I, I emphasize that there is a very strong Chavista base, and so insofar as there's a narrative, that, that is a part of what I, I think is critical to the narrative. The, the, the administration feels as though they, they have support, and that as long as they have um, um, much, much or most of their original support, they are absolutely <coughs> determined um, um, to confront the demonstrators, etc. And I, and I saw that um, in all kinds of ways on the ground. The other, the flip, the uh, the other dimension of this that I noticed, um, that I and I believe is still very important today, is that because of Chavez's foreign policy and specifically his oil diplomacy in the Caribbean and elsewhere, it's highly unlikely that we are going to see any kind of hemispheric condemnation of Venezuela, mm -hmm. unless there is something cataclysmic. Um, because too many of the countries of the Caribbean are depending on, in particular, the Petro Caribe program, which sells deeply discounted, um, or actually what it is, is um, uh, highly, that, that sells oil to these small economies in a, with highly concessionary um, long-term financing. Um, and um, in a recent vote at the OAS, country after country after country voted right down the line um, um, according to the way that the Venezuelan government wanted them to vote. And in many cases, these are people, since I, I know many of them, um, who actually have a quite critical view of what's happening in, excuse me, internally in Venezuela. But, um, you know, the, the combination of their own self-interest and the deep tradition of non-interference in each other's affairs militates against them taking any kind of aggressive position vis-a-vis -vis Venezuela, which is part of the reason why I, I suspect that the current circumstance will go on for a very long time. I would like to add another information on uh, some issue, economical issues. In 2007, uh, Chavez uh, adopted uh, Nuevo Bolívar, mm -hmm. or also was known as Bolívar, Bolívar. Bolívar. Mm -hmm. so a strong value. Uh, in, in appearance, uh, we, have, we were recovering our economy, volvió uh, el dólar a 430, so, and everybody was happy, they said, well, we were uh, probably Chavez were doing the right thing in, in regards to the economy to so, Indonesia. Um, but it, it's, it's amazing that uh, recently we noticed that uh, under Spadulo's uh, presidency that, uh, that the currency units were devaluating 400%. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, the question of the deposit was going on. So um, um, it's a, and, and under Maduro's presidency, it's the second devaluation because when he was entering, mm -hmm. and we didn't know if uh, Chavez died until uh, March the 1st, uh, uh, he, he, he devaluated again the, the currency from 450 to 630 uh, dollars per US dollar. So um, it's, it's, it's uh, amazing how this kind of uh, people is asking. What's happening? So it is. Um, uh, uh, and we were discussing about the importation of different basic goods. Uh, we're bringing some beans from China, rice from Canada, coffee from Nicaragua, sugar from Cuba, chicken from Brazil, beef from Argentina. So what we're producing in Venezuela? Only oil. So that's the question. So it's it's uh, 
um, uh, I know that I was uh, creating cooperatives, for example, mm -hmm. right? People in the community try to do, uh, you know, uh, create their own job and, and try to be independent, you know, for different. But uh, uh, the, the real situation is that if Venezuela, for example, received 50 or 60 million dollars per day, in regards only for uh, for oil, and people from the lower and middle class have to do an line to buy a, a petroleum, so does it make sense for you? Is <laughs> so uh, there are some questions that are people in the community to say, well, what's going on? And what, what we're doing is is uh, this the revolution that we're supporting for the last 15 years, for example? Even some Chavistas right now are questioning you know, that kind of things. Uh, it's not a, a secret for anybody that uh, Maduro have, you know, doesn't have the same leadership or charisma than Charles. Mm -hmm. that's, that's a real reality. So the other thing is that uh, probably uh, some very important people who are right now in the, in the government were not during the Chavez regime because there are some I mean, it's not a secret for anybody. There are some people who are disappointed, and now they are not proud of the Maduro's government. Let's get some more questions from the audience. Yes, sir. Yeah, um, you spoke about the uh, economic policy of the Venezuelan government. I guess in the past year, we've seen how it's running out of fuel. Uh, as you said, um, what are the chances, or when will the government be forced to uh, reconsider this economic policy, or is it ever going to reconsider it, or is it just going to continue deepening uh, its debt, and is it going to continue devaluing the money? Uh, I would say there is not an economic policy. Mm -hmm. okay. I mean, the, the government is extremely certain that it is not capitalist, but it hasn't really quite figured out yet what it is and what, what kind of model it wants to have. So it just sort of does things and sort of fits and starts. Um, so. Um, it's, it's really ironic. I mean, if Chavez, were just, if Chavez or Maduro would just sort of see the utility of, of certain types of production and, and investing, then the, I think the, the, they could stay in power indefinitely. But as, you're, as we've been sort of talking about, this is this thing that will probably, if there is a demise of a, of, of a revolution, it will be this, it will be the economic sort of collapse. Um, so, I mean, I. I was hoping to talk about chickens because it's one of my favorite things to talk about. That's so it's, it's the whole thing that happens with, with, with chickens is that they um, the, the, they have price controls, of course. They say, okay, chickens have to be, say, $3 a piece. Right? So, okay, people go to the market, and I remember when this happened, and they're like, oh, chickens are $3. So everybody buys all, all the chickens. Uh, the only problem is that it costs $4 to produce a chicken. And so you go back to the store uh, six weeks later, and there's no chickens. And so people would complain, where are the chickens? So the government began to import them from Brazil, and they're like, okay, they're five dollars a piece. Right? So the people are going to the market and you're buying the chickens for three dollars. Uh, and it looks like they're three dollars, but they're not, they're five dollars. So you're paying the tax on, on everything. Um, and what has happened? So people think they're getting chickens for three dollars. But you've destroyed domestic production because nobody in Venezuela is making chickens anymore. Uh, you've exported your production to, to Brazil. So you're sending money to Brazil to, to support their poultry industry. And uh, people are paying this invisible tax on the food. And that's another kind of reason why it's unsustainable. That's this kind of the, the thinking again is always, well, whatever it is, we'll use our, the oil money to take care of it, whatever the shortage is. And that's why you've seen the big, the big lack or scarcity. The, the other, there is one other, one other aspect of that, and that is that the government has attempted to um, uh, stimulate uh, production in the oil sector. And so that they continue to bet very heavily on the oil sector, and there are a number <coughs> of international firms that um, have, uh, have, um, are betting that they can, in fact, um, uh, exploit some of these um, new leases in what's called the FACA. Um, and, um, and of course, if they can substantially increase um, oil production, certainly the government's um, uh, coffers can be um, rebuilt. Yes. Well, let's take this. This okay. token and then that gentleman. Okay. Yes. Uh, I have an observation. Those who, of us who have become uh, citizens of this country, uh, especially. Try not to vote for the Republicans. The, uh, the politics. 
politics of the Republicans uh, horrify us. Uh, and that's uh, how or, or why uh, we turn uh, to vote for uh, the Democrats. Now, the Republicans represent the right in this country. Um, many people say that uh, extreme right. The same way that the uh, right in Venezuela, uh, Lopez, Corina uh, Machado, uh, and all the rest, Capriles, uh, et, et cetera, et cetera. called uh, National Endowment for Democracy, which is, uh, was uh, inaugurated uh, from uh, Reagan times. And uh, the money for, from our taxes goes to that right in Venezuela. Mm -hmm. Now, why do you think that the Venezuelans are going to accept that right, if uh, ever uh, comes uh, to power, when they haven't done anything for the uh, marginal classes of, mm -hmm. of Venezuela. I will defer. A very good question. Brian, do you have any comment on that? Um, Yeah, I mean, I, my, my, I, I, I'm a Democrat, and I've always voted for the Democrats. So um, that kind of uh, narrative, as I kind of mentioned at the beginning, was kind of what I was going, expecting to kind of find in Venezuela. And while that is true, and I definitely understand why there is a, a, a strong uh, anti-U.S. position in Venezuela, and why there's this sort of fear of the right. Um, in, in the end, I wasn't still able to sort of support Chavez or sort of empathize with that because I felt that I, you know, if you did a range, then uh, and you put like Obama or, you know, these kind of standard left people, I, it, Chavez was, was significantly out here. You know, there was such a large degree of difference between what I considered my leftist position and his leftist position that I felt I couldn't really support the government. So I, I, I mean, I agree with you, but I also think that um, we're dealing with a group of um, uh, people who are uh, radically left and who believe in violence, who believe in uh, not following democracy. And so that's why my position on, on Venezuela has, has been uh, against the government since I did the research on it. And when I when I did the, uh, just briefly, if you go back and look at the 60s, it's a really informative in understanding what's going on in Venezuela because there was a very powerful leftist insurgency in Venezuela. Um, the, the democracy just kind of taken hold in 1958, and Castro had come to power, and it's just sort of this awesome moment for Latin America. The Castro could do this, then you come, come out of Sierra Maestra and uh, take control uh, of, of Cuba. So um, it sort of galvanized the, the left. And Ch uh, Castro, in turn, had sort of picked Venezuela as the ideal country with which to export the revolution. So uh, he was pouring lots of money and arms and, 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 and uh, military advisors into, into Venezuela. And a lot of people aren't aware of this, but there were, there were two uh, coup attempts by um, the, within the military, they were supported by Castro. They bombed the U.S. Embassy. There was um, kidnapping of military personnel. There's even a small invasion at the beach of Mancharito in, in 1967. 
And um, what's interesting is what <coughs> happened to all those um, gorillas after the 60s, because it, it eventually it collapsed. At the end of the decade, it collapsed. Because it never kind of got the support of the poor. And then also, um, um, Castro was forced to stop sending money and arms um, because the Soviets threatened to pull subsidies if he didn't. And <coughs> what's so interesting about that is how many of those important people came to mentor Chavez, and the most important of, of which was a, a guy named Douglas Bravo. And Bravo, um, he, when the rest of the Communist Party denounced violence at the end of the decade, Douglas Bravo was the only one who said, no, I'm going to continue a violent struggle against the government. And the reason he did that is, and it isn't so much like sadistic, like, oh, I, I just want to be violent. But he said, and he said this to Chavez, he says, the Communist Party, or our, our type of, uh, what we want to do here, we will never win in the ballot box. We will never be elected. Okay? The, it, there's not enough of a, of a court that will believe in us. So to come to power, you have to do it uh, with a populist disguise. This is what, so you have to have a populist disguise. You need to come to power in a coup where it looks like you're representing the masses. And through that coup, then you can continue, you consolidate power and slowly develop um, the communist agenda. So that, um, that sort of idea, of course, you, you can see exactly how it played out. That's exactly what Chavez tried to do in 1992, failed. But he kept the populist disguise. He was able to sort of still become that sort of icon of the people and was able to come in finally through the ballot box. So I guess that my point is that um, what you're saying is true, and I understand that there's that, that, um, that there is a distrust and suspicion and there's good reason for it. But the people that are running Venezuela are of a radical, very radical type um, that will continue to um, oppress and use violence to the same power. Yes, recent events in Venezuela, there seems to be a division in the opposition. Um, both sides uh, seem to have like an argument against the other. So when you see the camp of Capriles and Julio Borges, they're continuously saying that their way is onto the future when people from the slums